All right, Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. All right, Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There's a part of me that wanted to put this as separate, but I'm going to put this with the Bible study uh, exercise since it is, has been inspired. <laughs> it has been declared necessary because of our study in Matthew chapter 24. But if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 24, you know, if you remember, I don't know, I'm assuming you know, but in Matthew chapter 24, we made it up to verse 29, right? Matthew 24, 29. I think we've looked at everything. Just remember, we believe, well, it's not that we believe, It's a dogmatic fact that any basic reading of Matthew 24 lets you know that the context, that the the whole situation is Jesus walking out of the temple. His disciples say, hey, look at these buildings. He's like, it's all going to be destroyed. And they're like, wait, what's going to happen? When is this going to happen? How is this going to happen? And he begins to give them signs that any normal reading would tell you is about the destruction of the temple, which we know when it occurred in 70 AD. There's just, I don't know how that can be ignored, but... Yeah, clearly it can be by people. So that's the way we read it. That's, that's the basic thing. So our job is to go through Matthew 24 and see if we can determine if all of these signs have been fulfilled leading up to 70 AD. I understand people say, no, no, no. It, some of it jumps to the future. Well, you've got to determine when it jumps to the future by, first of all, removing all possibility of it being fulfilled when? Before 70 AD. And so we believe that we, we covered almost everything. Verse 29 creates lots of problems. Does everybody remember? The first problem is, it says what? Immediately, Immediately after the tribulation. Now what's the problem? What's the problem that verse uh, presents? What tribulation? Right? It says the tribulation of what? How does it define it? Those days or, yeah, I think it says those days. Yes? Does everybody, does all translations say that? All right, those days. First, it would make you think, well, that's got to be referring to 70 AD, right? Because that would be the tribulation you think it's referring to, right? But then it goes on to say this. So the first problem is identifying which tribulation it's referring to. Others believe it's a future tribulation, but even that poses problems, right? Uh, others say it's the tribulation in 70 AD. That poses problems. No matter what you do, this verse has problems, right? And what's the second problem? What it describes happening immediately after the tribulation, which is what? Sun darkened, moon shall not give her light, stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Right? All of that poses a problem. First, it poses a problem because, wait a minute, that did not happen right after 70 AD. Everyone agree? Right? Number two, if you put that as a future tribulation... Most people, when they talk about a future tribulation, talk about what period of time? A seven-year tribulation, correct? The problem is that doesn't occur at the end of the seven-year tribulation. That occurs somewhere in, in the middle of it. So what some people propose is, no, 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 no. After the tribulation of those days is not after all of the tribulation. It's over. It's after the first half of the tribulation. Well, that requires a complete... Like, isn't that great that you can just make it say that? It doesn't say that. It says after the tribulation, right? So you have to make it read after the middle of the tribulation. But even that becomes problematic because now you've got to go to Revelation and figure out when it talks about the sun, moon, and stars, is that happening in the first half or the second half, right? Then you have to try to establish that. All kinds of issues. So no matter which way you go, there's a problem. So what we looked at is what's the preterist solution to the verse? What's the preterist solution to the verse? We've already talked about this now multiple, 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 multiple times. No, they say that, well, in a way they do. What they say is that if you go to the Old Testament, you see that exact same language as referring to the destruction of Babylon and other cities. Well, it didn't happen. So they're like, therefore, this is language, symbolic language to describe the destruction of a city or a nation. All right. Others will say, no, 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 no. That's referring to a future time. 
wherever you go, there's, there's problems, all right? So we, we I, I gave everyone homework to look up every passage that refers to the sun, the moon, the stars that are darkened, and let's look at all of them. So that's what we were going to work on. People have sent me their homework, and we've been working, and, and people have done a good job, but we are going to take a detour from doing that. I got the book right here, the Preterist book, so that they can offer their explanation. Simply put, hey, that language is used in Isaiah. It didn't happen. Therefore, it's symbolic. Others will say, well, that language in Isaiah is pointing to what happens at the end of the tribulation. And you're like, well, wait a minute. It doesn't fit the end of the tribulation because at the end of the tribulation, you don't have this. All of the problems exist no matter which way you go. Okay, bottom line is, This verse, I'm just going to say it, and I don't care who gets offended, it's almost a verse that's impossible to interpret in any meaningful way. And I know you're not supposed to say that as a Protestant, but I don't care. Every solution is problematic. And when you listen to people on all sides, they just ignore the problems. Like it's no big deal. Or offer some weird solution like, well, that's not what the text says. Well, No, this is how you read it. But that's not what the text says. Like, what gives you the right to say it means this and it goes against the very words used? And, now, think of it this way. If the meaning goes against the actual words of the text, then how do we interpret any verse? Is that a good question? Okay, everybody should say, that's a great question. Okay, that's a great question. All right. So, we were going to work on that, but we've gotten sidetracked. We have to. Go back to Matthew 24, verse 15. Matthew 24, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. All right. There's the abomination of desolation. All right. There are two views here, right? The abomination of desolation refers to what? There's two views. Everybody in this church should know the two views. What are the two views? When the Romans came and destroyed the temple. I, I, I don't know why people don't like that solution. A lot of people hate that solution. I don't know how you can hate it, right? You literally have someone doing what? Literally, I mean, what, what more of an abomination, what more of a desolation than when there's nothing left standing, right? The abomination is, well, the Gentiles, the Romans come in and destroy the temple with their pagan symbol. And they, I mean, by this, they're declaring themselves to be greater than God because they're literally destroying the house of God. That, to me, that fits perfectly. Some people hate that. No, 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 no. So they believe that this refers to what? What's the second solution or the second view? One is 70 AD, but people hate it. So what's the other view? No, 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 no. Because that can't be 167 because Jesus, that that happened before, right? There's going to be a future temple, right? And that in this future temple, the Antichrist is going to walk in and declare himself to be God. And that's the abomination of desolation. Now, for for their view to occur, what would have to occur to that temple? Well, it has to be rebuilt, but then it would have to be destroyed because what's this whole chapter about? Destroying of a temple. So, right? So there's problem number one. Do we read about the destruction of a temple in in the book of Revelation? Right, there's a problem, correct? Okay, but not only that, the second problem is you're just ignoring the context that it's written, right? Why wouldn't you go with 70 AD when it just seems to fit so perfectly? But to get around this, everybody's like, here's the problem. You're not reading 2 Thessalonians. That's the solution. Everyone thinks 2 Thessalonians is the solution. So I've already done one podcast episode where I worked hard on 2 Thessalonians, but we're going to go far into this tonight. So be ready to take lots of notes and get really, 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 really confused. All right? Because you're probably going to hear a presentation on 2 Thessalonians that you have never heard in your Christian life. I don't remember I do too many episodes a week to know which day I did what, okay? But I know I did it, okay? All right. Everybody ready? Second Thessalonians. All right. So a lot of people like Second Thessalonians, it's the, it's the solution because it, it fixes this. All right. So before we do anything else, let's just go through this quickly. First, all right, 
When was Second Thessalonians written? 51 AD. Let's say we, let's go all the way and place it at 61 AD. Let's go all the way and place it at 65 AD. The issue is everyone agrees that Second Thessalonians was written when? Before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So that means we would have to at least entertain what? That if you read something like this, um, in if I can find uh, Second Thessalonians two four, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. When you read something like that in Second Thessalonians, written in fifty one A.D., how would they have understood it? They would have been looking at something happening when? In the temple that was standing, correct? Right? But once again, the attitude is, no, forget them. I I reviewed a sermon by MacArthur on Matthew 24, where he literally said that none of those signs in Matthew 24 were for the disciples. Not one of them. And that Matthew 24, 15, the abomination of desolation happens first, then all of the signs in verses 4 through 14, then they occur. Completely eradicating, the, destroying the entire, like there's, there's not even any chronological order. And then when it says immediately after the tribulation, he didn't even bother to, to explain what that meant. Just ignored it. Well, isn't that sick? I wish I could just do that. Just ignore everything and make the, if I ignore everything, I can make the Bible say whatever I want it to say. Isn't that great? Isn't that, I, that's what I've got to, that's what we need to start doing. We probably would have more people here, right? Let's just pretend like it's simple, okay? But it's not. So the first issue with 2 Thessalonians is it was written in 51 AD, all right? Second thing that I think is, is interesting. Look at a couple of passages. Everybody ready? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I've got to go quickly. First Thessalonians chapter 2. I think we'll look at verse 14. Right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 14. 1 Thessalonians. Yeah, 1 Thessalonians. Right? Because both letters was written to whom? The church at Thessalonica, right? So 1 Thessalonians 2, 14. For ye brethren, for ye brethren, he's referring to the people he spoke to, right? Or for the people he's writing to. For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered the things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted and they please not God and are contrary to all men. The Jews were doing what? Jews were persecuting people. Right? Jews were persecuting people. Everyone agree with that? I mean, don't we read that in Acts? Yes? Right. Right. Don't, we agree? don't we agree? Okay, go to Acts 17. Acts 17, we got to go quick. Oh, we're not going to get anywhere close to finishing this. Okay. Acts chapter 17. Where do they end up in Acts chapter 17? Thessalonica, right? Where was a synagogue of the Jews, right? Does Paul go in and preach or teach in there? He reasoned with them out of the scriptures in verse 2. Okay, just skim down and tell me what happens. The Jews attack and assault people. Yes, is that what happens? Yes, what verse is that? Verse 5 and following, yes? yeah. The, so in Thessalonica, the Jews were persecuting those who were trying to preach the truth. Does everyone agree that that's true? Right? It, no problem with that? Yes? Okay. Now, 
It is believed. So therefore, what would be causing a lot of problems for those in Thessalonica? Jews persecuting them. Agreed? Right? That would be a major issue that they would be facing, or at least be one of the issues that they were facing. Correct? Now, uh, the, Paul writes to those in Thessalonica somewhere between 50 and 52 A.D. That's interesting. And he's going to try to provide some kind of comfort, some kind of encouragement, try to let them understand what's going on. Agreed? Now, this is very interesting. Judgment comes upon the Jews 14 years later during the Jewish-Roman War, which goes from A.D. 66 to A.D. 73. That's interesting, right? Jews who are persecuting them, judgment's going to come upon the Jews. In fact, Judaism is basically going to be what? Wiped off the face of the earth. That's probably very significant, maybe, all right? Um, when, uh, when we recall the words of Jesus, it's no surprise that Paul expected his first century readers to personally experience relief from their afflictions. They write, and their argument here, is that it's possible that when Paul's writing, he's writing to offer some kind of comfort to those who are being afflicted, some kind of understanding to those who are being afflicted. Don't you think that's a reasonable idea? That he's writing to people at that time who are suffering. I I think think it's a reasonable reasonable thing to consider, maybe. Jesus had likewise promised to come in his kingdom in judgment with his angels and his father's glory while some of his 12 disciples were still alive. Now that goes to Matthew 16. Some people believe what Jesus is referring to there is coming in the transfiguration. Some people say it's referring coming in 70 AD. We could have a big discussion about that. All right. But Paul viewed the coming judgment upon apostate Israel as a good development for the spread of the gospel among the nations. Paul would have seen it. Hey, if they're judged... And, and somehow that persecution stops, then the gospel can do what? Go forward without anyone trying to stop it. I think that makes sense, all right? Now, now if we read here, go back to 2 Thessalonians. Now, if you read 2 Thessalonians, let's start in verse 1. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not so soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that day as the day of Christ is at hand. All right. They are bothered or troubled and he doesn't want them to be bothered or troubled. And what... What are they could be bothered and troubled about according to that verse? Well, what's the words used there? Right? But, yeah. Okay. As that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't be troubled. The day of Christ is at hand. Right now, he's saying that to whom? Brethren. To those in Thessalonica. He's to those he's writing to. Correct. Right. We know who he's written to. Right. Hey, don't be troubled by anything. The day of, of Christ is at hand. Seemingly to imply he's referring to something that's close to them. Now, some people say, "Well, everyone thought it was close. He didn't really know when it was close." But he's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Yes, uh, that has to at least raise some questions. Agreed. Right? So far, so good. I got to go as fast as I can. All right? All right. Then, verse 3. Hey, the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man... Very, this is very similar to what Jesus did in Matthew 24, right? Hey, this is going to be destroyed. Don't let anyone deceive you. Right? So the day of Christ is at hand. Don't let anyone deceive you by any means. For that day, whatever the day of Christ is referring to, shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So there's two things they're going to be, they're going to be on the lookout for. A falling away and the son of perdition, whoever this may be. But he's telling them to look out for it, right? Telling them to look out for it. Correct? All right. So this raises lots of questions. All right. So this is how uh, one 
one commentary, but well, there's two commentaries here um, from two different people, but here we go. Paul wrote to a church that was apparently entertaining concerns that they had missed Christ's coming. For Paul wrote, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be so soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if, it, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. We must consider the nature of their expectation about these things. And I think it's true. We would have to, we need to take some time to go, what were they thinking? What, were, what was in their mind, right? Because we always forget the people that this is written to. We almost like, ah, who cares about them? What, we have to care about them. What were they thinking? When they're thinking the day of Christ, what, was, what did that mean to them? What did that mean to them? And if they thought they missed it, that's got to give you some idea of what, of, of what they thought. Let me, give you a, let me ask you a question. If they thought that this meant all Christians were going to be raptured out, how could they have thought that they missed it? Especially if the Apostle Paul is writing them. Correct? If they thought this meant the end of the world, I don't think you think you could miss that. Right? So what, did, what were they looking for? Those are good questions to ask, correct? All right? Um, for, and I'll read again. For if their expectation of the Lord's coming was that it would bring an end to the world or that it would result in the instant removal of all believers from the planet, it's hard to imagine how they could be led to believe that these things had already occurred. If the day of the Lord referred to a rapture and they thought it may have already occurred, why was Paul still around? As, uh, as David Lohman wrote, now if, on the other hand, the Thess- the, those at Thessalonica believe the day of the Lord to be the coming judgment against apostate Israel, then asking about that event would make sense. And if they had friends or relatives in the Judean area, it would be easily explained their concern that the day of Lord had passed. If they were thinking, no, the day of the Lord is a judgment against these people who are persecuting us. So did it happen? Like what's going on? Oh wait, I got people, I got friends living in Judea, right? And I wonder if possibly in 51 AD, if those words of Jesus about the coming destruction of a temple could be somewhat troubling and bothersome. Possibly. I'm not saying that this fixes everything. Just stay with me, all right? So they had two events, according to Paul, had to occur before the day of the Lord would come. Whatever the day of the Lord is. Two events had to occur. Look at verse 3 and 4. What were those two events? Of 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. Falling away. Son of perdition be revealed. All right? Okay, now, let's do this really quick. We don't have a lot. What what does the falling away mean? What does the falling away mean? All right, falling away. What is the falling away? Now, I know I'm covering ground I've already covered, but that's okay, because I got to get everyone on the same page, all right? Oh, very good. Okay, okay, just leave that. Let's look up the word. Let's look up the word, though. All right? This is very important of what this is referring to, yes? All right? Oh, I mean, why am I going to Jude? Okay. We're in Second Thessalonians. I'm, I'm, we're going back to Jude, okay? I'm, I'm already ready to get to, to Jude. All right, hang on. Yeah, that's where I'm going to, yeah. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and the falling away occurs in verse 3, correct? Everyone agree? All right. What is this falling away? Falling away is this Greek word. Everybody ready? Strong's G646, apostasia. 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 All right. Now, apostasia, it's used two times to forsake or falling away. All right. It can be a defection from truth, falling. Uh, oh, listen. Okay. It can be a, dis, a defection from truth, properly the state. That's interesting. Falling away or forsake. Strong's definition has this: a defection from the state. It's a rebellion against the state or some kind of falling away from maybe a governmental authority. That's kind of interesting, is it not? Nobody thinks that's interesting. That's super. 
Super interesting, right? Uh, apostasy, obviously, can just be a falling away, a defection, apostasy. So you have to ask, a falling away from what? Does the text say what it's a falling away from? There's going to be a falling away first, then what's going to happen? All right, now. Uh, this says, uh, this, the apostasia in verse 3 is rendered by most modern translations as the rebellion or the revolt. According to Strong's Concordance, it's a word that can mean either a revolt, rebellion. Okay, well, I don't know if that's completely fair. It can mean a departure or falling away from the state. I think that's a better way to put it. Would everyone agree with that? Did Paul predict a spiritual falling away? Right, it could look like a rebellion, yes. I mean, obviously, if you're falling away from the state, yeah. Now, most people think that this is referring to a spiritual falling away. This is a popular idea, but this word can also indicate a social or political rebellion. We know from the Jewish historian Josephus and other sources that in 66 AD, a large-scale rebellion rose up in Israel through the efforts of the zealots leading to Rome declaring war on Israel. The rebellion began 14 years after Paul wrote this letter. Is that the rebellion he was referring to? Is that the falling away he was referring to? All right. Paul wrote this letter, although the seeds of that rebellion were already taking root by the time of Paul's writing, and there had been smaller outbreaks even earlier. So in verse 3, Paul made the argument that Christ's coming in judgment against Israel would not take place before the great rebellion led by the zealots had already begun. The argument is the day of Christ there, if that's a day of judgment upon Israel, well, before that was going to happen, there would be a great rebellion that took place. And that great rebellion started when? Well, leading up to 66 AD, which led to the war, led to the very war against Israel. All right, does that make sense? Yes? All right. Now, the next thing we have to look at is, so there's the falling away. What's the next thing that's described here? Son of perdition. Son of perdition. How does the NIV translate this? Man of lawlessness. All right. Let's let's go back to the concordance here, or to the uh, interlinear, I should say. Um, the, uh, the King James says uh, that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. <clears throat> you see all of those phrases, right? How does the NIV do that? <clears throat> well, verse three, is that two, is he described two different ways? All right. The man doomed to destruction. Okay. Or the man of sin. All right. Now, if we go with the man of sin, Okay, the man of sin, of sin here would just simply refer to uh, to miss the mark, to wander from the law of God. It, it would be the idea of, you could argue it could be translated lawlessness in the sense that it's going, it's a man that's going against the law of God, going against the things of God. All right, okay, I think that's a, a, a good way to put it. Son of perdition, if we look at that phrase, Yeah, just of perdition would just be a, a, a man of destruction. Son of destruction, son of destroying, perishing, destruction, destruction which can consist of eternal misery in hell. All right? So this is the son of destruction, a son of damnation, a son of ruin. All right? So this is a man of lawlessness who obviously is connected to destruction of, and judgment of some kind, all right? Does that make some sense? All right? Now, this is what they say. What is the significance of the title man of lawlessness? Some may be tempted to simply see this man as a reckless leader with no regards for local or international laws. However, the law that was held in the highest regard in Paul's world was the Mosaic law, the law of Moses. It's very likely that Paul was saying that this man would trample on the law of Moses and freely commit sin under the law. 
The fact that he would sit in the temple is another clue to the meaning of lawlessness because the temple was central to the practice of Mosaic law. Look at 2 Thessalonians. Does it say he's going to sit in the temple? Look at verse 3 or verse 4. Yeah, you see, uh, verse 4 is, Who opposeth, referring back to the son of perdition, the man of sin. Everybody see that? All right? Who's going to sit in the temple and basically showing himself to be God. Everybody see that? All right. They're saying that this man of lawlessness is someone who's going to trample underfoot the law of Moses, right? The, and basically, as they say, the, the fact that he's going to sit in the, in the temple is another clue to the meaning of lawlessness because the temple was central to the practice of Mosaic law. This would also confirm that he was revealed while the law was still being practiced. So they make an argument that if this man is the man of lawlessness, and this refers to the law of Moses, this would make more sense that this would occur before 70 AD because that law would have still been what? Practice and in effect. All right, I think we can agree. But that all really is destroyed when? 70 AD, because what happens? Can't have a, you don't have a high priest. You don't have a sacrificial system. It's all destroyed, all right? I think we can agree with that. Now, this is very important. We can know a close relationship between lawlessness and rebellion in these verses. The man of lawlessness, right? The man of lawlessness, and we have a falling away or a rebellion occurring. That would, those would fit together very well, right? You have a falling away a rebellion, and you have a man of lawlessness who's going to be revealed. Those two factors would go together very well. I think that you see how that fits together. Okay? I'm not saying it's perfect, but just stay with me. Let me take a drink of water. Oh, I'm trying to go fast. I wanted to get so much further into this, but that's okay. All right. The zealots, now this is true historically, The zealots were about to lead a massive rebellion against Rome. And Paul's readers knew this had been the goal for some time. So the man of lawlessness would naturally come from their ranks. So you have the zealots at this time. And so it would make perfect sense that the zealots could be the one from which a lawless one, who's going to trample under the law, trample under his feet the law of Moses, would come from the ranks of the zealots. Josephus, who chronicled that rebellion and war of the Jews. I cannot stress this enough. I cannot stress this enough. In fact, I'm almost going to become dogmatic about this from now on. The next time someone wants to argue with me about Matthew 24 or 2 Thessalonians, I'm going to ask them, have they read War of the Jews by Josephus? If they have not, then there's no point in arguing because they have no historical basis to interpret 2 Thessalonians. Now, I know I go, it goes against the Protestant mindset, because the Protestant mindset says what? I don't need anything. Just me and my Bible and the Holy Spirit. That's all I need. Okay, but it doesn't quite work out that way, right? Why, why would we need possibly the writings of Josephus here? He's giving us which context? historical context. What do we say all the time? How can I understand the, the text if I don't know the history surrounding the text? Right? Have we not talked about how important 70 AD is to, to interpret the book of Hebrews? Yes. How important is uh, 70 AD to interpret Matthew 24? Critical. And how, interpre- how important is 70 AD to interpret 2 Thessalonians? It may be absolutely critical. I'm not saying that it's the definitive, and again, I'm not saying Josephus is the authoritative, like he's infallible, but he gives us history that we can go, that may fit right there. And should we not be willing to consider if it possibly fits? Because what are we not interested in? We're not interested in a, a particular system of eschatology, are we? I'm not committed. I'm not wearing the colors of a certain team, right? I don't care about that. We care about, What could this possibly mean? Yes? So we should be willing to look at everything. Does that make sense? All right. So what's the name of the book? 
War of wars of the Jews, wars of the Jews, and I may and I, I spent a good portion of today reading a good portion of the book, and I've got hyperlinks when we get further into this to everything I referred to. I've got hyperlinks to that specific section in wars of the Jews because the book is available for free online. Okay, all right. In that book, uh, Josephus ran out of adjectives. Uh, 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 to describe how wicked it was and how profound the zealots violated the law for they for which they were supposed to be so zealous. They were supposed to be zealous for the law, but they kept violating the very law they were supposedly zealous for. All right? Now, what is verse 4? Verse 4 talks about the man of lawlessness exalting himself against everything, right? Yeah. And then he proclaims himself to be God. The temple known to the Thessalonians Thessalonians, and which was famous throughout the Roman Empire, was burned and destroyed when? 70 AD, only about 18 years after Paul wrote this letter. At the end of this, now we're going we're gonna to look at some things that happen at the end of this, okay? So there's a lot more here we could talk about. Let me just make it, this is what I would make it clear. There's nothing in 2 Thessalonians that would indicate, wait a minute, he's not referring to the temple that was standing at the time. He's referring to a future temple. Would everyone agree there's nothing there that would demand a future temple? So our first thought would be, could this have been fulfilled when that temple was standing? Right? So all you have to do is find something that could possibly fit that happened somewhere between when? 51, 70. That's a what? How many years? I'm not good at math. 18? 19? Nineteen years is that fair? Okay, so I've got nineteen years to figure out if something happened. If something happens that fit this, then what do I do? Possibly fulfillment. Yes. Now I don't know why that makes people nervous. People get look, I, it's so weird to me that that would bother someone. Wait, wait, what are you doing? Are you more committed to your system of eschatology? Or are you more committed to figuring out what this means? I guess got to... And here's the thing. The average person who reads this, they, they have no clue of the history between 51 and 70 AD. Let's be honest. If I was to give a history test to 90% of Christians sitting in a church about what happened between 51 AD and 70 AD, do you think they would pass it? Right, of course. Yeah, you wouldn't no, forget, but you should have learned it in school. But okay, but okay, but yeah, you're not going to learn it in church. But the point is, the average Christian is not going to have a clue. How many Christians have read Josephus' works on the the War of the Jews? Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably almost nobody. Well, my thing is, you shouldn't be offended. Like, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What are you saying? I'm saying that maybe your left behind book is wrong. I'm saying maybe the left behind movies don't get it right. It's okay. But, 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 but I learned Bible prophecy. from. No, you know what you learned? You didn't learn Bible anything. You learned someone's system of prophecy. That's what you learned. Because if you were studying the Bible, you would have questioned all of these things. But, so we shouldn't get nervous if our system of eschatology ends up like fluffy, taken out back and put down. Right? Because and no actual animals are being hurt. Okay, the, the reason we say this is because what do we care about? What the text says. All right? So there's nothing here that would say, oh, there has to be a new temple. No, the temple was standing when Paul said these words. Now, this is where things get interesting. All right? You ready? What if the miss... Okay, now uh, continue reading here. All right, um... Look at verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So what is the mystery of iniquity and what is the thing holding it back? Right? What do we typically interpret the thing holding it back to be? We think it's the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit is going to be removed when? And the rapture, right? That, and how that's typically interpreted? What if the mystery of, of lawlessness, are you ready? What if the mystery of lawlessness was a reference to the zealot movement, which had been gaining steam since Hezekiah the zealot rose up in 47 BC 
and especially since his son, Judas the Galilean, had led a failed rebellion in 6 AD. What if that's the zealots? Oh, already happening then. Yeah, right. It's already happening then. So what if it's the zealots? Well, if it's the zealots, then who is holding it back? All right. Well, here's a little bit more about them. The goal of the, the zealot movement was to regain for Israel the full independence, which had been won by the Maccabees from 164 to 142 BC, but which was lost after Pompey the Great invaded in 63 BC, and Herod the Great began to rule over Judea, uh, or, uh, Judea in 37 BC. Their long-planned rebellion finally exploded into a full-scale war uh, around August. Uh, August A.D. 66. There you go. So, so it blows into a full-blown war in August 66 A.D. And that's according to Josephus uh, and uh, his... The mystery of lawlessness. The zealots. Well, we're going to get... I've, I've got three, na- three na- two names. The, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. All right. And then we know what happens uh, when that war occurs. Jerusalem is going to be filled with abominations. And Josephus mentions this, obviously, in his book on, uh, the, well, the, the Jewish wars. Okay. All right. In fact, I've got it right here. Um, some of this is mentioned in Book 2, Chapter 17 of the, uh, the War of the Jews. I have the hyperlink right here. So if anybody disagrees, it's right there. Okay. I don't have time to go read everything from Josephus, but it's right there. Okay, does that make sense? Now, who's the restrainer? Not, not, in, not, not in this context. Not in this context. All right. What if the restrainer were the Jewish high priests who led the peace movement in Jerusalem? Josephus and War of the Jews wrote a great, great deal about how they were a thorn and the side of the zealots. So you had the zealots. There's the mystery of, of iniquity working. And Paul already says it's working at that time, right? They're the ones causing all the problems. And then you had the Jewish high priest who were a thorn in their side, pushing back and trying to hold the zealots back. Now you have it all falling into proper historical context, yes? I'm not saying this is perfect, just stay with me, all right? Uh, Josephus himself talked about how that these these Jewish high priests led a peace movement in Jerusalem, and then in the War of the Jews, he, he talked about how they were a thorn in the side of the zealots, and at times preventing the zealots from fully doing doing as they please. When the Jewish-Roman War began in A.D. 66, the peace movement was led by Ananus ben Ananus and Jesus ben Gamaliel. Right? I'll, I'll give you the names again, all right? There's two individuals. Ananus, A-N-A-N-U-S, Ananus Ben Ananus, or Ananus, however you would like to pronounce it. Those would be the restrainers, right? They would, they would be the ones, the priests that were pushing back against the, if we call the mystery of iniquity here, right? Ananus Ben Ananus, and Jesus Ben Gamaliel, G-A-M-A-L-I-E-L. All right. Let me write to give you those names again. Ananus or Ananus Ben Ananus. That's that's how it's there. A N A N U S. Ben A N A N U S. And Jesus Ben Gamaliel. G A M A L I E L. Or Gamal Gamaliel. I guess is how you would say it. Gamaliel. Or Gamaliel, Gamaliel, I guess is how you would pronounce it. All right. So I'll I'll do the first name again. A-N-A-N-U-S, Ben, A-N-U-N-U-S, and then Jesus, Ben, 
Gamaliel, G-A-M-A-L-I-E-L. All right, these would be two key individuals. Their long speeches against the zealots can be seen again. I've got them right here. I've got the hyperlink. You can uh, read about it in book four of War of the Jews, chapter three. All right. War of the Jews, book four, chapter three. You can you can read some of their uh, some of this. OK, so uh, and there's a number of other places. But basically, their, their long speeches against the zealots can be seen. Josephus said that Ananus preferred peace above all things, was a shrewd man in speaking and persuading the people, and had already gotten the mastery of those who opposed his designs or war for war. In late AD 67, the zealots appointed a fake and completely unqualified high priest. His name is Phanius. P-H-A-N-N-I-A-S. Right? Well, sp- uh, political and spiritual. All right? So they, they, an unqualified high priest. Now, why is that significant? He's unqualified. Where does, where does the high priest go? Oh, no. Oh, no. 67 A.D. All right. So the zealots appoint Phineas, right? P H A N N I A S. They appoint him, and he basically becomes their puppet. Again, this comes from that. Com- this is described in War of the Jews, Book Four, Chapter Three. Right. And you can read a lot of this. I mean, it's all available for anyone who wants to read it. Okay. All right, so he becomes the puppet of the zealots. At this point, the people of Jerusalem could no longer bear uh, what was happening, but did altogether run zealously in order to overthrow that tyranny. They bas- basically, people in, in Jerusalem get very upset, like, what is happening here? Be- because what is basically happening to the temple? Being desecrated. Oh, no, wait. Uh, did Jesus predict anything like that? I, I can't, I, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. All right. Uh, but their progress came undone because of the trickery of John Levi of Giscala. And Giscala is G-I-S-C-H-A-L-A. John Levi of Giscala. He, he, he has some trickery here. We'll, we'll have to, uh, we could go into all the details, but he, he stops their attempts to try to fix the problem. Now, guess what happens? Ananus and Jesus, right, and not, not the Jesus, but Jesus, what's his name? Gamaliel, right? Both of them are killed along with the other priest during the zealot temple siege that happened somewhere between February and March of A.D. 68. The peacekeepers are killed. So, some believe that's when the restrainer is taken out of the way. The deaths marked a significant turning point for Jerusalem, according to Josephus. I quote, I should not mistake if I said that the death of Ananus was the very beginning of the destruction of the city and that from this very day may be dated the overthrow of her wall and the ruin of her affairs, whereon they saw their high priest and the procurer of their preservation slain in the midst of their city. His words are, when they die, that's when the destruction of Jerusalem really begins. When they die, that's, that, that's the thing holding everything back. That's when it was removed. That's the words of Josephus. Well, I, I mean, a lot of people put this stuff together. So I'm just grabbing from all kinds of sources. So I didn't do much. I didn't. I, oh, Josephus did an amazing job. Yeah, yeah. Josephus. Yeah. Now, we may call, some, may, some historians call his accuracy into question, but I'm just saying 
he, he's got things that are so similar to what we're reading here that it's a hard time. You can't just ignore it. That's all I'm going to say. Does that make sense? I know people are like, but wait, this doesn't go with left behind. I know it doesn't. Okay? But maybe Paul knew more about it than what people writing in our time. Maybe Josephus knew more than the people writing in our time. All right? To say all in a word, if Ananus had survived, they had certainly compounded matters, and the Jews had them but a, had put abundance of delays in the ways of the Romans if they had such a great general as he was. According to Josephus, if these men would have lived, they may have actually stopped the Romans or been able to delay the Romans because they were such good leaders. But then once they were dead, it was over. It was over. Beginning of the end. After their deaths, the zealots were unrestrained. Hear those words? They, this is, and I'm quoting, they fell upon the people as upon a flock of profane animals. They cut their throats. Others endured terrible torments before finally meeting their deaths. At least 12,000 people died in that one massacre. Yeah, the zealots were killing. Yeah, they were like, oh, enough of this. You think you're going to hold us back? Now, there's nothing holding us back. Now we're going to start killing anyone and everyone. Well, you, yeah, you could, you could argue that, yeah, that would be a good motivator, right? Okay. Um, Josephus described how the zealots increased their wickedness because the peace-loving high priests were no longer there to hinder them. I quote from Josephus, the zealots grew more ins insolent, not as deserted by their, not as deserted by their confederates, but as freed from such men as might hinder their designs and put some stop to their wickedness. Accordingly, they made no longer any delay nor took any deliberation in their enormous practices, but made use of the shortest methods for all their executions when they had once resolved upon and they put in practice sooner than anyone could imagine. So in, in other words, once these people were dead, they were like, it's ours. Let's do whatever we want to do. All right. So the, so we have the restrainer being taken away. All right. Now we're not going to have time to go through all of this. All right. Cause I got all kinds of quotes from Josephus. All right. And all kinds of things take place. All right. A lot of stuff here. All right. Okay, this is crazy, all right? Now, we have the man of lawlessness who goes into the temple, right? Okay, right? Well, there's, there's, we, 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 we no, yeah, but I'm saying in, in 2 Thessalonians, we have the man of lawlessness or the man of sin goes into the temple. Everyone agrees? All right. Paul specifically stated that the man of lawlessness was one who, number one, opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Would everyone agree that's an accurate reading of verse 4? Number two, the Lord will consume with his breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Everyone see that in verse 8? Verse 8? Everybody see that? During the Jewish-Roman War, there were two zealot leaders who took their place inside the temple. The first one made the temple, including the inner court, his headquarters for 3.5 years. Isn't that interesting? From the fall of A.D. 66 until April A.D. 70. He was killed in Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And that person was Eleazar ben Simon. Yes. Eleazar ben Simon. All right. So he, he literally makes his headquarters inside the temple. See, we don't even, nobody even talks about any of these things happening. Nobody even talks about any of these things happening. The second one 
took over the inner court about five months before the temple was destroyed, precisely when the Roman general Titus arrived and began his siege against Jerusalem from April to August A.D. 70. He was captured and taken to Rome and sentenced to life in prison. And guess who that was? John Levi of Cascala. So a second person takes over the inner court. Okay. Right. Well, that means the zealots had taken over everything. Once... Oh, well, okay, all oh, right, yeah, he wasn't killed, right, yeah, he, he is taken to Rome, yeah, and he's sentenced to life in prison, I don't know why he, that's a good point, that's a very good point, the other man died, yeah, so the Romans come in and they're like, hey, what are you doing in here, hey, come with us, okay, right? we're going to put you in prison for life, maybe just to, they wanted someone as an example, I don't know, that, that's a good point. All right. Now, I'm going to have to stop there, but I have, just so that you know, I have profiles of Eleazar ben Simon, and I have a profile all from Josephus' writings, and I have a profile of John Levi of Gascola, all from uh, Josephus. Now, uh, John Levi from Gascola, uh, he wrote extensively about him in the life, it's found in the book, uh, The Life of Flavius Josephus. All right, that's, that's a different book um, where that man is described. Okay, it's a separate book. All right, does that make sense? All right, so what can we say? I know, man, I, had, I hate that I went so fast through that. Oh, I hate I went so fast through that. So let, I got to at least take about five minutes to try to summarize, okay? I do apologize if I went too fast, but uh, I was going as fast as I possibly could. All right, here we go. Go back to 2 Thessalonians. Everybody ready? All right, Paul writing to people who are being persecuted by the Jews. We see that in Acts 17, correct? All right. These individuals, he, wa- he wants them not to be so shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. He tells them the day of Christ is at hand. Now, we immediately read that to mean what? In our modern day evangelical mind, what do we immediately read that to mean? The second coming. We immediately, and we say that has nothing to do with them. That Paul just thought the day was coming, but he didn't really know. Now, hey, you could make that argument, but you could also ask, I wonder if the day of Christ here is referring to something else. I'm not saying it does. I'm not saying it is. People are going to get mad at me. Uh, You've got to listen to what I'm saying. I'm saying that is it possible this is referring to something that we've never thought about, correct? Correct. All right, next verse. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Is it possible that the falling away there is not a great spiritual falling away? I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm saying is it possible that this refers to the rebellion that was underway and that the man of lawlessness is a man who would be breaking all of the laws of Moses and that would be all go together. Is it possible? Maybe. Right? Agree. Uh, I'm just saying maybe. Yes? Everybody got that? That this man of lawlessness who exalted himself and sits in the temple of God and does all of these things, is it possible that it was one of these individuals who literally... Guess what? Went inside the temple and made it their headquarters. That's pretty crazy, is it not? Not only that, we also have record that they appointed a fake high priest to go in and do whatever the priest did. So you you have all, all kinds of options of people going into the temple doing wrong kinds of things. Not only that, you have Titus himself who's going to destroy it. So you've got all kinds of options in front of you. Does that make sense? I'm just showing you that there was all kinds of things happening in that temple that we don't even know about, that we don't even pay any attention. Well, our minds are, forget you, those at Thessalonica. This has nothing to do with you. Paul wrote you a letter, and I don't even know why he wrote it to you. He should have sent it to my email inbox because you were all going to die. This had nothing to do with you. But it would make a lot of sense if a lot of things he's writing about had something to do with what was going to occur within the next 14 to 18 years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, not just that. He seems that he's really telling these guys, I need you to, to know this, right? So is it possible oh, that the man of lawlessness could be a lot of these individuals, right? We have two individuals. Who are the two individuals? The first one was, 
Well, that's the Phineas was the, uh, the fake high priest, right? Who, go, who, who obviously went in. So then I guess we could say three. And the next one was Eleazar ben Simon. And the next one was John Levi of Gascala. All of them would have, had, would have been going into the temple. And there was major issues with what they were doing. Agreed? Okay. D- does that make sense? All right. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So, so Paul's already been telling them about these things. See that in verse five. And now you know that with uh, that. And now ye know that withholdeth that be not. Okay. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Is it possible that that was referring to one of the individuals who possibly were holding back what the zealots were attempting to do, right? And what were the names I gave you for those two uh, individuals? Uh, and, uh, okay. There you go, All right? Could, I'm not saying it's those. I'm saying, could it be? We immediately, how do we read it in our evangelical mind? The Holy Spirit. Now, you could question... Does Paul ever refer to the Holy Spirit just in a, uh, such a vague way? I mean, couldn't Paul just said Holy Spirit? Yes. That's a good question, right? I mean, has the word has the ter- words Holy Spirit been written by Paul in other letters? So why does he just drop the? Why does here he has to go all mysterious? Okay, um, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Why? Why would you have to do that, right? Why couldn't he just say the Holy Spirit? I, I think that's, that's a reasonable question because we can read the writings of Paul and does he not refer to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit? He even says we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. He even he says we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Agreed? So I, I think that he would have the ability to do that. I, I think that's important, all right? Um, And then uh, verse 8, Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, I'm not, once again, we have a difficult verse, yes? I don't know how we work around it, but I do know this, right? That those who were inside the temple, one is killed. And when 70 AD occurs, we do know that. Right, yeah, right. he's killed. I'm not saying that that fulfills this. I'm not saying it's perfect. Because once again, we have, just like in Matthew 24, you have so many verses that can be easily explained with history, yes? And then all of a sudden you get to one and you're like, what do I do with this? I'm not saying that there's a good explanation there. I'm not even trying to pretend that there's a good explanation. What happens in the next verse? Even him whose coming is after the work, working of Satan with all power, signs, and by, by uh, lying wonders. Josephus writes about people, these, these people coming, doing all kinds of lying signs and wonders leading up to 70 AD. And I've got all the words of Josephus. I, I skipped that entire segment because I was going to go through all of that. All right. And with all deceival, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth and that they might be saved. And for this God, God, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie for they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Paul seems to be making it very clear that destruction is coming upon all of these individuals or that this situation. Put it this way. He's clearly letting them know that this situation is going to be resolved and these people are going to be destroyed. Whoever they are, whatever the event is, he seems to make that clear, right? Now, if this was supposed to comfort the people in, in, that he's writing to at the church of Thessalonica, did it provide them any comfort? No, because according to most people, it had nothing to do with them. It still hasn't even happened yet. And just like MacArthur did with Matthew 24, this has nothing to do with the disciples. And so, guess what many evangelicals do with 2 Thessalonians? Had nothing to do with them. Nothing. Nothing. Because according to uh, the modern evangelical thought, has the falling away occurred yet? No. Has the man of sin been revealed yet? 
No. So in other words, according to most the way we were, most of us were taught, this had literally nothing to do with the people Paul was writing to. So therefore, this provided what? No comfort, no help, nor any answers. Yeah, 96. Uh. Well, that's, that's why some people argue that it was written before. That's why some, because they're like, man, you think that they would have referenced something about the destruction of the temple, and the temple is mentioned in Revelation. So, but that's why, that's why if it's written after, you have a hard time believing that then that you would have to argue it's referencing a future temple. So that's where you would get a future temple from. If we could find an early date for Revelation, then you would have to argue that all of that is pointing. Some people would argue all of that's pointing to 70 AD, but in just some hyperbolic language. But that would then create all kinds of hermeneutical problems, yeah. right? That would create all kinds of hermeneutical problems. So let me make it very clear, and I'll just end with this. People get nervous right? Because they have their little, es- their system of eschatology and they hold it on like their favorite, you know, stuffed animal. Oh, I love it so much. Okay. You can't do that. Here's what I will say. I don't know if, even if everything in Matthew 24 was fulfilled leading up to 70 AD, even if everything in 2 Thessalonians was fulfilled in 70 AD, that doesn't mean in any way, shape, or form that that doesn't mean something can't happen in the future, Right? It just means that the text here would require us to interpret it as looking to 70 A.D. first. Why do we have to look to 70 A.D. first and 2 Thessalonians? Why? It was written prior to, right? And the writings of Josephus seems to fit some of these things pretty closely. We can't just ignore that. And Matthew 24, why do we have to look to 70 A.D.? Because Jesus is clearly talking about the destruction of the temple that was destroyed in 70 AD. It makes no sense that Jesus is talking about the destruction of a temple that hadn't even been built yet. Right? That, that doesn't answer his disciples' questions in any way, shape, or form. So, so both of those passages, we have to look at 70 AD. When I get to Revelation, all bets are off because everything indicates it was written after. So then by all means... Take Revelation and look to the future, right? I'm not saying that we never look to the future. I'm saying that a good Bible student has to be honest with the text that is in front of them, even if it goes against all of the Bible prophecy stuff that you've been taught. Because I hate to say this, people don't understand this. So much of what you've been taught as a Christian is not the Bible. It's it's the system that the pastor learned. You go to a school, like right here. here I, I went to a school where this was a textbook, Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. This was one of our textbooks. Well, I can look in here and guess what? They have studies on, uh, you see here, I can go through all of them. Oh, oh, the doctrine of prophecy. And guess what I was taught? Everything that's in this book. Like, what are they teaching me? Wilmington's system, right? Does he have lots of scripture? Yes. Proof texting the system. And guess where Wilmington got his system? From someone else. So pastors learn a system, right? Here's what we believe about prophecy. And then they take that system and they're like, this is what the Bible teaches. Then you've seen how Bible prophecy is taught. Here's the system. And then they quote a verse to proof text it. Well, that's not studying the text. That's just throwing out a proof text for you. And that convinces you that you got it from the Bible. No, you got got it from someone's system and they gave you a verse to proof text the system. You don't proof text the system. You set aside your system, look at the text in context, then see, here's what this says, now give me the systems. You want to study all the systems and go, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't... Well, I don't know if I like any of these systems. And people, oh, you can't do that. Oh, yeah, I can. Because as Protestants, I can do whatever I want, right? And, and that, look, if you want to argue for the Protestant Reformation, then I can use that to my advantage, right? 
I'm not bound by your system. You're not the magisterial authority. What's supposed to be the magisterial authority? The word of God. So if I'm going to practice that, then what must I do? I got to study this. And what's one of the key elements we always say about studying the Bible? We talk about textual context, right? And then what's always the next one? Everyone mentions it. Historical context. Everyone says that. Everyone says historical context. And then you bring in 70 AD as a historical context. And everybody's like, oh, what are you doing? Antichrist. Anti- I'm doing what you said to do. Historical context. There's a big historical context to 2 Thessalonians. It's called all of these writings of Josephus. who's was like, well, the zealots were pretty crazy and there were people resisting them and then they died and when they died, the zealots killed everyone and then they had two individuals who walked inside the inner courts of the temple, made their headquarters there for three and a half years. Oh, and then it was destroyed. I don't know. Should I not go, hmm, that sounds very similar to 2 Thessalonians, right? Does that make sense? Okay, now, I got to just make sure because most likely there's been like a, I hope there's not like a lot of comments. If you've been posting comments, I'm sorry. Because, well, nobody's been checking for me. I should have just, let me see here. Okay, good. No comments. Sorry. There's no comments from people like, that's it. Unsubscribe, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. Never listening to him again. Uh, he's a heretic. He's a heretic. He's a heretic. And, I, and isn't it amazing how you can become a heretic simply by pointing out the history that actually occurred? Isn't it amazing how we're so willing to throw out actual history for a future that we think is going to happen? When we have things that are, like we know the temple was destroyed. That's factual, right? It's just, it's just, it's just like, I like grabbing onto what I know has occurred before I start trying to figure out what may occur. Because I, I can figure out what has occurred because it's recorded in actual history books. Like m- much of that that we just read, we didn't even have to rely on the Bible. The Bible kind of described what happened and Josephus pretty co- came pretty close in filling in the blanks, did he not? Is it perfect? No. Do I think it answers all the questions? No. Do I think it can be ignored? Absolutely not. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this evening. Lord, forgive me for going so fast through all of this. I, I feel bad that I went so fast. I probably should have approached this a completely different way, but I did as much as I could, as fast as I could. I know a lot of this was repetitive, but I pray that well, we're definitely going to have to study this again as a church, and we will make the time to handle this in a more appropriate manner. But hopefully this was a crash course and at least considering the possibility that what Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica may have had actual clear ramification for the immediate history of their lives. Let us consider that and see how that should impact our interpretation so that we interpret it in a way that's truthful to the original intent of the letter. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said,